Hello, my name is Stephen Rowe. I'm an associate professor in the Division of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging at Johns Hopkins. And today I'm going to be discussing lessons learned from a clinical translation of a new imaging agent for prostate cancer. I do have a couple of relevant disclosures. So let me begin with the idea that when it comes time to clinically translate a new agent, this is after years and years of hard work of identifying a target, uh, developing the new radio tracer, uh, preclinically developing the, uh, the agent. Uh, once all of that data is collected, it, uh, it's time to submit an investigational new drug application to the FDA, or an IND. Uh, this investigational new drug application includes a cover letter, such as what you see here, as well as about 350 or 400 pages of boilerplate and various important aspects to the radio tracer. This includes chemistry manufacturing and controls, or CMC, uh, which uh, describes the um, current, current good manufacturing process uh, synthesis of the radio tracer, uh, as well as validation runs and other aspects of, of how the agent will be produced for use in humans. Uh, small animal dosimetry is typically included, small animal toxicology, as well as a draft first in human protocol. All of this gets sent to the FDA. They then have 30 days to respond. Typically during that 30 day period, they'll send uh, questions to the investigators and it's incumbent upon the investigators to respond to those questions very promptly. And then at the end of the 30 day period, if all the questions have been appropriately addressed, uh, the FDA will send the investigators a uh, uh, may proceed letter, uh, at which point uh, a uh, first in human clinical trial can, can take place. Uh, oftentimes the local institutional review board is reviewing the first in human protocol in parallel with the submission of the IND. Of course, one needs to start with having a good target and prostate specific membrane antigen or PSMA has certainly been uh, proven to be such a target in the last several years. It's revitalized the field of nuclear medicine and there are now uh, several radio tracers that have either been approved or are in the process of uh, undergoing evaluation with the FDA for potential approval. What makes PSMA such a, such a great target? Well, it's a transmembrane carboxypeptidase that's highly expressed on prostate cancer cells. Expression has been observed in more than 95% of prostate cancer tumors, although there's a higher level of heterogeneity at the cellular level than at the tumoral level. And there seems to be at least histopathologically a correlation between expression levels and tumor aggressiveness. Uh, here's an image of, uh, of uh, PSMA, which has a large extracellular domain that allows for the binding of small molecules, antibodies, uh, and uh, other agents to, uh, to this extracellular domain, and they can be leveraged for, for imaging and therapy. There are a number of uh, F18 labeled radio tracers that are in various stages of either clinical or preclinical development. Uh, the one that I'll be focusing on is uh, F18 DCFPYL. Uh, this is the agent that was clinically translated at, at Johns Hopkins. And uh, I'd like to start uh, describing some of the first in human study aspects and then sort of proceed through some phase two specific questions uh, through the phase three trials that were performed with this agent. And then also discuss some future directions and uh, emerging opportunities with, with this compound. So for a first in human study, I'd say that uh, the absolute paramount aspect to performing this is that uh, there has to be an establishment of the safety of the agent. Uh, this is going to be important for the FDA, and it's also going to be important for all of the studies that, that come after this. So uh, typically, this will involve vital signs on all subjects before and after the tracer injection. Uh, Subjects are queried for any symptoms that they may have during uh, during the the time that they're in the pet center, uh, having been uh, after having been injected with with the agent. Uh, there's also a call to the patients, uh, generally about one to three days post injection, to uh, query them for any uh, delayed adverse events that may have occurred. And then any uh, adverse events that do occur during the study uh, would then be categorized as being either likely to be related or unlikely to be related to uh, the injection of the radio tracer. So you might imagine a, a patient uh, could have a, say, a severe car accident uh, and have very severe injuries, be admitted to the hospital uh, during the time that they were technically on study. That is, those are all adverse events that the patient experienced, but not related to the radio tracer. Uh, 
So it's very important to make sure that uh, any adverse events that occur are both recorded, but also uh, categorized correctly. Uh, typically, biodistribution and dosimetry are an important part of a first in human study. So uh, these are images from the first in human uh, study with DCF PYL. See that uh, there are uh, a series of PET scans that are obtained, uh, typically with one or more attenuation prediction CTs. Um, in this case, uh, there were two because of a relatively long gap between the fourth and fifth time points. And this, uh, this establishes the biodistribution, which can be somewhat qualitative. We can see high uptake organs, such as the kidneys, uh, excreted uh, radio tracer in the bladder. Uh, but then it also allows for the creation of uh, organ time activity curves and calculation of dose to each organ. And then typically, uh, the first in human dosimetry will uh, include a table of absorbed doses for, for each organ. Uh, and here you see that for, for DCFPYL. Uh, metabolites are often performed as part of a first in human study. I would say this is uh, not universal, but, uh, but it's typically done at, at facilities that have this capability. And so this may involve uh, some combination of obtaining uh, urine and blood samples from the patient. Uh, and then looking at uh, the presence of uh, radioactive compounds and ensuring that uh, the radioactive compound that was injected is still a radioactive compound that's uh, in the patient or being excreted by the patient. Of course, some radioactive compounds will undergo some type of metabolism, uh, and that may necessitate characterizing the, the metabolites. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the only significant radioactivity obtained from the patient uh, throughout the time course of this study uh, remained uh, the F18 labeled DCF-PYL, uh, and there were no uh, appreciable metabolites uh, in the, uh, over the time course of this study. So what happens after a successful person human study? So I think it's a, that's the point at which it's time to define disease-specific clinical scenarios where there are important questions that might be answered with imaging. And we'll cover some of those for prostate cancer. And then we're going to establish the sensitivity and specificity in those different clinical scenarios. Now, that may or may not be tremendously important, depending on those scenarios and the agent that's being used. But that's often a sort of first uh, thing that's going to happen with, uh, uh, with these agents. So for prostate cancer, some things that we can consider as clinical questions would be uh, primary staging and men at uh, high risk of having occult, nodal, or distant metastatic disease. Uh, there's restaging and recurrent disease, particularly with a rising prostate-specific antigen. The situation is often referred to as biochemical recurrence. We can ask about establishing uh, a uh, whether the patients are oligometastatic, which may mean they have a limited number of metastases that would behave biologically differently than widespread metastatic disease. And we can then think about guiding specific therapy for oligometastatic disease. And then we also wanna think about selecting patients with metastatic disease who might benefit from PSMA targeted therapy after they run out of other therapeutic options. Let me show you a few examples of DCF-PYL in these various scenarios. Uh, here are two patients that both had uh, NCCN-defined high-risk primary prostate cancer. Both had undergone systemic staging with CT of the abdomen and pelvis uh, and bone scan. As you can see in patient one, uh, there uh, is a high uptake just below the bladder in the location of the prostate. Uh, in this, uh, and there was no other abnormal uptake with, with DCF-PYL. So after the PYL scan, this patient was still believed to be clinically localized, went to surgery, and has had a prolonged uh, biochemical recurrence-free interval. However, uh, the patient on the right, patient number two, uh, actually had unsuspected systemic disease. Uh, it was all nodal, but it was systemic. So it was outside of the pelvis and the retroperitoneum, uh, and even as high as the left supraclavicular space. Uh, this patient went to surgery, had an immediate biochemical failure, uh, and has uh, since necessitated treatment with systemic therapy. If we look at both the patient level and the uh, quote unquote packet level, which are packets of lymph nodes that are uh, removed during surgery, uh, DCFPYL has a moderate to high sensitivity at the patient level, about 70%, and a high to very high specificity, uh, again, at the patient level, about 
So these are actually uh, very good performance characteristics for the agent, uh, but we'll discuss whether this has sort of important prognostic implications later in the talk. If we move beyond primary staging and get into biochemical recurrence, um, this is uh, often a situation in which conventional imaging is unrevealing. In fact, for true biochemical recurrence or sort of a pure biochemical recurrence cohort, those will generally be patients that have a rising PSA but unrevealing conventional imaging. Conventional imaging here would generally be with uh, a CT of at least the abdomen and pelvis, sometimes the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, uh, and bone scan. The CT uh, can, uh, in some centers, uh, be replaced with uh, an MRI of the pelvis, uh, often including uh, sort of multi-parametric sequences, uh, the most important of which is going to be dynamic contrast enhanced uh, MR of the pelvis. Uh, here's a set of characteristics for a biochemical recurrence cohort that we investigated. Uh, as you can see in the, the, last, uh, the last row here, the PSA, median PSA was very low, uh, 0.4. And it ranged from uh, 0.2 to uh, over 20. But these were, again, all patients in whom conventional imaging was negative. So conventional imaging in this patient population has a 0% sensitivity uh, for detecting their sites of recurrence. Uh, when we did DCFPYL PET scans of these patients, we found that about two-thirds of them, we were able to appreciate a putative site of disease. These sites often can't be biopsied, so we don't necessarily have histologic proof, but they were sites that made sense with patients with uh, recurrent prostate cancer and relatively low PSAs. As PSAs go higher, generally the detection efficiency of the scan will improve, uh, as well as the number of patients that have more than one site of disease. Here's a couple of examples of what typical uh, findings on a patient with biochemical recurrence look like. Uh, here's a patient who has a small local recurrence in the prostate bed. It's just behind the, um, just behind the excreted radio tracer in the bladder. And in the bottom right, you can see this was confirmed with a follow-up dynamic contrast enhanced MRI of the pelvis. And then actually the most common finding in this patient population will typically be one or perhaps a couple of lymph nodes in the pelvis. Uh, oftentimes these are very small, in this case, maybe a couple of millimeters uh, that was able to still be appreciated with the, the DCFPYL PET scan. Now, if we move another step along the disease path to those men who have findings on conventional imaging, but they have a limited number of findings and still relatively low PSA values. Uh, these would be men that may define an oligometastatic cohort. In this case, there's a single soft tissue nodule in the presacral space that was identifiable on CT uh, and also had intense uh, uptake of DCF-PYL. Uh, this patient received a stereotactic body radiation therapy to that site of disease. Uh, they did not receive systemic therapy, so that, that's important. So they weren't being treated as if they had widespread metastatic disease. They were treated uh, focally to just that one site of disease. Their PSA became undetectable and has actually been that way for a couple of years now. So this is a, a patient that uh, may or may not be cured, but at least has had a prolonged interval uh, in which he has not required systemic therapy. Now we sometimes see the other end of the spectrum where men may be thought on conventional imaging such as bone scan to have a relatively limited amount of disease, um, such as in this case, a probable metastasis in the rib, uh, as well as a bunch of traumatic and degenerative changes. But when scanned with DCF-PYL, I uh, actually had widespread metastatic disease. This was all marrow-based. That's why it didn't show up on the bone scan or on the accompanying CT that he had done. Uh, sometimes there'll be a number of small subcentimeter lymph nodes that may extend throughout much of the body uh, that, uh, that can also be visible. Uh, in this case, most of this, uh, most of this gentleman's disease was, was marrow-based. So uh, obviously not appropriate for therapy to one or more of these sites, does need systemic therapy. Uh, this, I would say, is an unusual presentation. This patient did have a fairly high PSA, so we should have suspected that we were missing disease with conventional imaging somewhere. Uh, but again, this, uh, this amount of disease being able to hide on conventional imaging is not typical. And then here was a gentleman who had a uh, sort of an intermediate state between the last couple of patients. So there were uh, multiple sites of disease in the retroperitoneum and the pelvis. Uh, these were all nodal and uh, uh, these were all lymph nodes. Uh, 
The patient receives stereotactic body radiation to uh, all of the visible sites of disease and then came back with what were disseminated bone metastases. So presumably uh, these were present just below detection level on the baseline scan, uh, but nonetheless, this patient had a, a continuously rising PSA uh, despite getting good local control of the nodal disease with uh, the stereotactic body radiation therapy. So there's clearly uh, men that have a phenotype where they're going to respond well to uh, SBRT or some other kind of uh, um, focal therapy to their oligometastatic disease or metastasis-directed therapy. And then there are men who unfortunately are going to progress right through that and will uh, need systemic therapy. Uh, here are results from the oral trial in, in men with oligometastatic disease. So these are men who are defined as having oligometastatic disease on the basis of their conventional imaging. Uh, they uh, uh, also underwent uh, DCFPYL PET scans, although that those scans were not used to define them having um, oligometastatic disease. And what was found in a post hoc analysis is that if the uh, conventional imaging accurately reflected the amount of disease and men were treated to all of their visible sites of disease uh, or sites of disease that were visible with DCFPYL, uh, those men did much better than if there were sites of disease visible with DCFPYL that weren't included in the treatment plan because they were a cult with conventional imaging. What about men with more widespread disease? So uh, those men uh, can benefit from PSMA-directed therapy. Uh, typically, that's now done with uh, lutetium-177, a beta emitter, uh, although there all, are also alpha-emitting uh, PSMA-targeted agents. And uh, if you take men that are metastatic castration resistant so, and have failed multiple lines of therapy, often including uh, one or more lines of taxing-based chemotherapy, somewhere around 40% of those men will have an objective biochemical response with more than a 50% drop in PSA after treatment with uh, lutetium PSMA. About 70% of men will have some drop in PSA, uh, but, uh, but again, about 40% will have sort of what's considered an objective or uh, in this case, perhaps good response to, to TCM uh, PSMA. This comes at the cost of a relatively tolerable uh, uh, adverse events and toxicities. So uh, perhaps uh, a little more than 10% of men will have some grade of nephropathy, but it's typically low grade and will resolve without necessitating any intervention. About 20% of men will describe some degree of xerostomia or dry mouth, uh, but again, typically low grade and typically does not uh, necessitate any intervention on the part of the clinical team. So that brings us up to sort of the point. So what do we know now about DCFPYL? I think we know now that it has moderate sensitivity and very high specificity for preoperative nodal staging. There's a high detection efficiency for sites of biochemical recurrence. And DCFPYL is effective for guiding focal therapy for oligometastases uh, and also for selecting patients for endoradiotherapy. Now, with positive results from single center trials, it perhaps makes sense that uh, we would proceed on to multi center trials. And typically, phase three registration trials uh, are what are going to be necessary to be able to submit a new drug application and have something actually approved by the FDA uh, for. for um, widespread manufacture and use in, in humans. Uh, such trials should reflect the planned label for the agent. So if uh, the uh, if DCFPYL is going to be used in men with biochemical recurrence, there should be a registration trial that specifically enrolls men with biochemical recurrence and has some endpoint that is reflective of potential benefit from the agent. And then generally, these are uh, kinds of trials are going to need industrial support. That isn't universally true, but at some point to make something widely available to manufacture and market it, uh, those are things that are getting sort of beyond the uh, ability of, say, folks at, uh, uh, at an academic center to be able to do. Uh, let me just touch briefly on the trial designs of, uh, of the two registration trials that were done with DCFPYL. Uh, for the Osprey trial, there were two cohorts, uh, one of which was high-risk uh, pre-prostatectomy patients uh, who underwent DCFPYL and then proceeded to surgery with extended pelvic lymph node dissection. 
Uh, and that would get at uh, both sensitivity and specificity of the agent. And then there was a second cohort of men with uh, presumed metastatic disease who were imaged with ECFPYL uh, and then underwent a uh, biopsy of a, of a site of uptake to confirm that it was um, that it was truly a metastasis. So that would get at the specificity of the of the agent. Uh, the uh, uh, I will say with the Osprey trial, uh, the uh, specificity endpoint was met. The sensitivity endpoint, uh, the study did fall slightly short of. The uh, other registration trial was the Condor trial. And this is in men with biochemical recurrence. So rising PSA with unrevealing conventional imaging. Uh, this, uh, this study uh, looked at a composite true standard to establish if a site of uptake was a true positive. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, composite endpoint led to, uh, led to what was sort of the, uh, uh, the primary endpoint of the study was sort of a correct localization uh, based on the, the composite true standard. Uh, and this, uh, this primary endpoint was, uh, was met by the, the Condor trial. So that brings us to some ideas of sort of future directions with, with ECFPYL. So I think we can ask about uh, how prognostic findings are uh, for these patients. So a sensitivity and specificity are great, but if it doesn't tell us anything about how the patient's going to do, it's perhaps not uh, the, greatest, uh, the greatest agent that we could have. Uh, there is a, a complex, uh, interaction between androgen signaling and PSMA expression. And so are there ways that we can sort of follow these patients who are often receiving androgen uh, access targeting agents uh, and, uh, and use PSMA perhaps to uh, identify early progression or uh, again, perhaps find prognostic imaging biomarkers and how PSMA expression changes over time. Uh, I think we can ask about what role artificial intelligence is going to play and if there are applications beyond prostate cancer. So uh, let me first start with, uh, with some uh, prognostic uh, information. So uh, interestingly, if we, if we look at patients that have, uh, that were imaged for biochemical recurrence, again, so these are all negative conventional, and then with negative conventional imaging, and we ask what predictors there are or what associations there are between a positive scan and characteristics that the patient may have uh, underlying their recurrence, so things like Gleason score uh, or um, what uh, uh, clinical uh, stage their tumor was at at the time of resection or how rapidly their PSA is rising after their recurrence. Uh, we find that uh, men that fall into a European Association of Urologists defined high risk group uh, are much more likely to have a finding on their scan than men that fall into a low risk group. Although both uh, groups of men in terms of if their scans are positive, have equal rates of intrapelvic versus extrapelvic disease. So that's perhaps a little bit surprising. And if we uh, break this down across uh, a number of PSA ranges, we generally find that, that uh, again, men with, uh, um, men with uh, higher risk biochemical recurrence will typically have a higher detection rate on the scan. And if we break it down by location in terms of lymph node versus bone versus local recurrence, uh, we, we find the same trend that those men with uh, biochemical recurrence uh, will typically have uh, higher rates of detection across each of those, uh, each of those locations of disease. And now the initial experience with PSMA in response to ADT suggested that there was a flare phenomenon that occurred after uh, the administration of ADT, which is uh, androgen deprivation therapy. So this is an androgen axis targeted therapy. And again, uh, inhibiting the androgen axis does tend to drive PSMA expression. Uh, and so this makes perhaps some sense, but at the same time, <laughs> androgen deprivation therapy is also acting to uh, to kill the prostate cancer. And so despite the fact that we're driving PSMA expression, we're gradually killing off tumor. So we can get sort of strange patterns that may occur with that. Uh, we looked at this with a uh, two-center single-arm study uh, in men who were receiving a second-generation anti-androgen agent, abiraterone or enzalutamide. 
And what we found was that instead of a nice clean just rise in the uptake or size of, of lesions suggesting a flare phenomenon, we saw that some lesions appeared to do that, whereas other lesions became less conspicuous or disappeared entirely. And so we had to develop some methods of, of looking at sort of total tumor burden and how that changed over time. Uh, and what we found was that if we just looked at changes in PSA versus those changes on the scan, uh, there were some trends that were apparent. So if there was a uh, mixed response radiographically, although predominantly increased, uh, those men tended to have rises in PSA and relatively short uh, time to therapy change and short overall survivals, whereas uh, other patterns showed sort of a mixed bag in regard to percent change in, in PSA after initiation of therapy. But if we stratified men based on time to therapy change as a sort of objective means of determining uh, a surrogate, if you will, for progression-free survival, uh, we find that uh, uh, those men who had an overall either um, percentage increase or absolute increase in, uh, in the amount of uh, PSMA uptake that was visible on the scans, those men tended to have uh, relatively short uh, time to therapy change, whereas men that had a relatively lower increases uh, had a statistically significant longer time to therapy change. Perhaps even more interesting was that uh, this actually was also observed uh, in regards to overall survival. However, if we just look at baseline tumor burden, we actually didn't see a statistically significant impact on either time to therapy change or overall survival. Uh, let's look at another example of, uh, of a type of androgen axis targeted therapy uh, called bipolar androgen therapy, where men are continuously androgen deprived, but also receive uh, intermittent high doses of testosterone, but with a theory being that this would keep their prostate cancer uh, sort of dependent upon uh, androgen signaling uh, and, and prevent it from developing sort of a castration resistant phenotype. Uh, what we found was that uh, uh, there was a subgroup of men who uh, did not have new lesions on follow-up imaging, although their <clears throat> lesions may have gotten bigger, may have gotten smaller. Uh, they didn't have new lesions, whereas there was a subgroup of men that did have at least one definable uh, new lesion on their scans. And then when we followed these men uh, serially with conventional imaging, they, uh, if they had a new uh, lesion at their follow-up DCFPYL scan, uh, those men progressed in those sites of disease uh, at, at relatively early based on conventional imaging, whereas those men that did not have these sites of disease on DCFPYL, typically it took them longer to reach an objective radiographic progression with conventional imaging. So this would suggest that DCFPYL is able to pick up earlier progression than uh, we see with conventional imaging. Now, uh, as, uh, as these agents are disseminated, we do need ways of uh, kind of standardizing an approach and uh, categorizing lesions that may be indeterminate, may require follow-up, uh, may require a different imaging modality to completely characterize. Uh, this uh, prompted us to develop the, the PSMA RADS system, which uh, uh, we have found uh, has a high inter-observer reliability. And if we uh, consider something to be indeterminate uh, based on PSMA RADS, uh, when we uh, follow it serially, when we follow those lesions serially over time, uh, we do find that uh, some of them respond to systemic therapy or focal therapy, some of them don't. Uh, and so we're able to get at which of those individual uh, indeterminate lesions are true positive for prostate cancer and which aren't. Uh, and it's about 75% of lymph node lesions and maybe about 20% of bone lesions uh, will be true positive on follow-up. So the predicted value of indeterminate lesions with this system is much higher in soft tissues than it is in bone. Uh, we can interestingly do something as simple as uh, point spread function reconstructions in order to uh, improve our uh, diagnostic certainty regarding a, a percentage of these um, of these indeterminate lesions. 
And we can also potentially leverage uh, artificial intelligence to perhaps uh, narrow the gap and get rid of some of these indeterminate lesions and eventually have 100% uh, things that are determinate based on, uh, uh, based on a, a large amount of uh, training data that would go into an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm. I don't think we're out of jobs just yet. Uh, there's sort of increasing evidence that uh, AI may not be replacing uh, radiologists as fast as we expected it to. But there are some really powerful things that AI is able to do. So uh, we've uh, already seen that it can provide lesion classification, it can provide a whole body tumor burden assessments. Uh, and our hope is that eventually we'll be able to have uh, very refined and nuanced prognostication and uh, decision making support based on AI findings. Uh, here's just an example from, uh, from uh, our group, a uh, very talented uh, uh, PhD student, Kevin Leung, has uh, developed a, uh, a system to uh, automate the uh, determination of the PSMA RADS scoring. Now, what about PSMA expression in non-prostate cancers and whether there are applications beyond prostate, uh, beyond prostate cancer? If we first uh, look at conventional renal cell carcinoma, this almost never expresses PSMA, <coughs> excuse me, on tumor uh, epithelial cells, but the neovasculature does typically express PSMA. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, here we can see an example of a man with uh, relatively widespread uh, uh, conventional or now often referred to as clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And you can see that uh, his lesions uh, nicely light up with, with DCFPYL. Uh, and that includes uh, brain metastases. Although there's not background brain uptake with uh, PSMA targeted agents, uh, once there's blood brain barrier breakdown, uh, we are able to get those agents into, into the tumors. And even relative to FDG, which has uh, a uh, uh, controversial but, uh, but seemingly at least somewhat important role in uh, metastatic uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, we can see that ECFPYL both picks up lesions that are missed by FDG uh, and also has much higher tumoral uptake in lesions that, uh, that are detected by both, uh, both radiotracers. And in regards to specificity, uh, this uh, is uh, um, data from a gentleman who uh, was dying of widespread metastatic clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, he volunteered to be imaged uh, and then undergo uh, an autopsy after his, uh, after his death. Uh, and we found that uh, lesions that were uh, occult on conventional imaging but had been picked up by DCFPYL uh, were in fact true positive. Now, uh, with, uh, uh, with response assessment in renal cell carcinoma, I don't know that we have uh, gotten at the, the real heart of this yet, uh, but uh, importantly, there's, uh, with, RC, with renal cell carcinoma, there's uh, no biochemical marker like there is uh, with, uh, with prostate cancer and, and prostate-specific antigen. And so, uh, but I think we can imagine that if we're using neovascular targeted agents, such as tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, PSMA uptake is a readout of neovascular density. And so we may be able to predict response to those agents. Uh, and we may also be able to see early response to those agents. I think this is a, a, a still, uh, still an area that we need to explore a lot, but, uh, but I'm very excited about. Uh, if we look at uh, high-grade gliomas, such as uh, glio glioblastoma multiforme, uh, the, uh, the areas of uh, enhancement on MRI typically correspond well to areas of uptake with DCF-PYL. Um, those are also areas of, of blood-brain barrier breakdown. And unfortunately, it looks like any area of blood-brain barrier breakdown will have some degree of, of uh, of DCF-PYL uptake. So uh, I don't know that we're going to be able to have the specificity and tell apart uh, changes in uh, due to, say, therapy effect versus, uh, versus true tumor and viable tumor progression. But what we may be able to do is at least uh, uh, set the stage for potential uh, therapy applications and, uh, and what is otherwise a, a rapidly progressing and, and uh, uh, short overall survival disease. Uh, if we look at breast cancer, uh, there's some data in the literature to suggest that PSMA-targeted agents uh, 
have some facility with metastatic breast cancer, although probably not uh, significantly improved relative to FDG. Um, that's been our experience as well with DCFPYL. Uh, we can see primary tumors, nodal involvement, uh, bone metastases, but uh, the uptake is, is relatively modest compared to some other diseases. Uh, with uh, well-differentiated non-radio iodine avid thyroid cancer, there may be some lesions that have uh, DCFPYL uptake, uh, but this seems to be uh, this seems to be relatively heterogeneous, and there's a lot of interlesional variability. So lesions that still have uh, radio iodine uptake uh, may not have any PSMA uptake, but there may also be lesions that have PSMA uptake but don't have any radio iodine uptake. So I think this is uh, uh, an area that uh, still requires a lot of investigation before we can say anything definitive about thyroid cancer. Uh, and then transitional cell carcinoma. Uh, this is uh, this is sort of the the uh, flip side of the coin, I suppose. Uh, despite there being evidence at the histologic level that uh, that urothelial carcinomas uh, express uh, uh, PSMA in their neovasculature, it doesn't seem to be to a degree that we can uh, reliably detect uh, lesions with uh, with DCFPYL or other PSMA targeting agents. So I think there's uh, already multiple indications for diagnostic PSMA-based uh, imaging. Um, these have been extensively explored, uh, but uh, we still have a lot left to learn. We're just starting to understand PSMA-targeted PET imaging uh, findings as uh, imaging biomarkers, but we're in a good position with, uh, with an impending hopeful FDA approval of DCFPYL and approval of one or more other agents uh, that, uh, that we can start to explore this. And then that will feed into things like uh, AI and big data and, and learning from, uh, from perhaps non-traditional uh, metrics on imaging, uh, what we can tell about patients. Uh, I'd certainly like to uh, thank uh, all of my uh, collaborators, uh, a few of whom are here, although there are, are many more, uh, as well as uh, funding agencies uh, for, uh, for providing the backbone of what I discussed with you today. Uh, and with that, I'll conclude and hope that this uh, session has been helpful. Thank you.